نحمده و نسلی علی رسوله الكریم اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم رب شرح لی صدری و یسر لی امری و احلل عقدتم من لسانی یفقه قولی و جعل لی وزیغ من اخلی اللہم فکہنا فی الدین اللہم الہمنا رشتا و عزنا من شروری انفسنا اللہم ارنا الحق حقا و رزقنا اتباعا اللہم ارنا الباطل باطلا و رزقنا اجتنابا آمین سم آمین السلام علیکم و رحمت اللہ و برکاتہ O you who have believed, do not prohibit the good things which Allah has made lawful to you and do not transgress. Indeed, Allah does not like transgression. So changing the orders of lawful and unlawful as of ordered by Quran, changing these laws by our own innovations and fabrications is what? It is gross transgression. It is fisk. Because remember, the decision of declaring or enjoining something as lawful or unlawful, as prohibited or permitted, as halal or as haram, is basically what? It is the right of Allah. It is the right of Allah. And Allah does not let anyone take charge of this right. And anybody who tries to take charge or anybody who tries to meddle with the lawful and unlawful concepts of Islam is what? is a transgressor and eat of what Allah has provided for you, which is lawful and good and fear Allah in whom you are the believers. Verse number 89, Allah will not impose blame upon you for what is meaningless in your oaths, but he will impose blame upon you for breaking what you intended of oaths. So its expiation is Expiation of what? Of breaking an oath. Of breaking an oath, the expiation is the feeding of 10 needy people from the average of what you feed your own families. Second option is of clothing them. Them means whom? Of 10 needy people. Clothing 10 needy people or freeing up a slave. But whoever cannot find or afford, then a fast of three days is required. That is an expiation for the oaths when you have sworn, but guard your oaths. Thus does Allah make clear to you his verses that you may be grateful. So in this verse number 89, in the starting verse of Surah Al-Maidah, Allah had said, But now here in this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is suggesting an atonement, an expiation for the breaking of pledges or oaths. And uh, we have talked about uh, the a concept of oaths previously in Surah Baqarah also. And Allah is again talking about it in this verse. And here to start with, Allah is mentioning about the meaningless oaths. Now these meaningless oaths actually refer to what the people of Arabs, they, they were used to it. And they used to adopt these meaningless oaths as a point, uh, as a part of their speech. And this was like a pointless part of their speech, like during conversation, they were in a habit of repeatedly saying, Wallah, talla, by Allah, they used to keep on saying that. And this was just not as a pledge. It was not an oath or a promise. It was just not, it was not swearing. It was just as a part of their conversation, which they used to uh, they used to indulge in. So Allah said that there will be no blame will be imposed on them. But when they made an intentional oath, when they swore, when they swore and they made an intentional oath or a promise, and then they broke it, then they will be held accountable. Then they will be asked, then they will be asked for it. But there is another thing which we learn from traditions is that Prophet Sallallahu said that whoever makes an oath, whoever makes an oath of committing a sin, or leaving a righteous or a pious deed, then the person should do what? The person should break his oath and give an atonement and carry on doing the righteous deed or the pious deed and stop from the sinful act. Like you see, there is uh, there are two sisters or there is a 
there is a sister-in-laws, two sister-in-laws, and they get into a fight with each other. And one of them just swears that I will never ever meet you again. I will never enter your house. I will never ever see your face. This is what? This is uh, this is a pledge, or this is an oath, or this is swearing for what? For for the breaking of relations of kith and kin. This is what? This is what Prophet ﷺ said, La rahm, that any person who breaks or severs the relations of kin will be will not be entering Jannah. So if in a state of being angry or being furious, one of the ladies swears that she will not meet her sister or swears that she will not enter the, uh, the, uh, the house of her sister-in-law, this is breaking the relations of Cain. So she cannot keep saying that now that I have sworn, I can't enter her house and I won't be going to see her and so on. No, what she needs to do is she needs to break her oath and she needs to discontinue her pledge or uh, pay an expiation or atonement for her oath and in any of these forms, which has been suggested by this verse, and she should carry on doing the right and proper conduct as has been guided to us by Quran and Hadith. Verse number 90, Allah says, Ya ayyuhallazina amanu, innam al-khamru wal-maisiru wal-answabu wal-azlam. Allah says, O you who have believed, indeed, intoxicants, gambling, sacrificing on stone altars to others in Allah and divining errors are but defilement from the work of shaitan, so avoid it that you may be successful. In this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has talked about four things out of which, two of which we have already discussed, that is sacrificing on stone altars and divining arrows. Allah has called, uh, has talked about it in verse number three of Surah Al-Maidah, where we've, been, we've talked about it. Now, the rest of the two things which Allah is mentioning here is intoxicants and gambling. After the revolution of this final verse of Surah Al-Maida, the gambling of all forms, which was, which was prevalent in Arabs, this was announced as unlawful and gambling in whatever forms may it be, betting on races, games, sports, or for derbies, for any form of races of animals, this is all considered unlawful. And the money which has been removed, which has been received from such sources is considered as unlawful and haram. The second thing which is being talked in this verse is about all forms of intoxicants. Remember this verse of Surah Maida is the third verse which was revealed in Quran regarding the order of all forms of drinking, alcoholism and intoxicant. The first order was revealed in Surah Baqarah and then the second was revealed in Surah An Nisa. These two, um, the verses of the verses of these two surah, they are very much there. We recite them, we read them, we memorize them, we even uh, recite these verses in the salah. But the me the message of these surahs has of these two verses from uh, verses from Surah Bakara and Surah Nisa regarding intoxicants. These are annulled, meaning that we can not never, we cannot, or no longer can we derive order from these two verses. So despite such clear cut words as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has announced about all forms of intoxicants, people still tend to disbelieve and people tend to argue saying that intoxicants are not prohibited in Islam because the word of haram has not been mentioned and has not been used. Now, if I go about analyzing the words of this verse to understand the position or the status of the commandment regarding the intoxicants, if you see one of the words which Allah uses is rizsum. Ritz is what? Ritz 
refers to in Arabic, it means anything which is of intense impurity. Ritz actually means and refers to intense, severe form of impurity. And we know that Prophet Wasallam has said, that purification and trying to keep your cells, your bodies, your everything clean is what? It is half of the faith and half of uh, the belief. And Allah says in Surah Al-Baqarah, in Allah yuhibbu tawwabina wa yuhibbu mutatwakhirin, that it is no doubt that Allah surely for surely loves all those who keep themselves pure and who repent. So anything which is intense impurity and sheer and ultimate form, the worst form of impurity cannot be permissible or cannot be halal in Islam. Similarly, Allah is calling this as what? It is has been labeled as Amali Shaitan, the work of Shaitan. So the work of Shaitan can obviously, where Allah says, Innahu lakum mubin, and where Allah says that all those who will be following Shaitan will be what? They will be all dumped in hellfire. So all the works of Shaitan, the activities of Shaitan cannot be allowed. It cannot be permissible and halal and lawful in according to the teachings of Quran. And then <coughs> <coughs> And then the next word which has been used in this uh, verse regarding the orders of intoxicants is Allah orders fajtanibu. Fajtanibu means what? To refrain from it, to stay away from something. And you know what? If I explain what this refraining from a thing means is, it means something, refraining from something is an order which is even more strict, which is even more strict firm and clearer than haram itself. Because, you know, as for a list of certain things, as we've already talked in verse three of Surah Al-Ma'idah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has clearly announced that these are haram and they it is not lawful to eat those things. So even despite, as Allah says, So all these things that all forms of dead blood, flesh of the swine, all these things which are which are, have been sacrificed on stone altars or other deities beyond Allah, they've all been considered as what? Hurrimat alaykum. Or Allah says, innama harrama alaykum. But there, along with all these verses, Allah also announces about all these unlawful things, saying, But a person who is under forced conditions and but does not want to trans, uh, transgress or be sinful or be disobedient and does not exceed beyond the limits. If he becomes and doesn't even want to be habitual about this sinful consumption of halal, the haram thing, then there is no sin on him. So even these things which have been clearly highlighted and announced as unlawful and haram, even under certain circumstances, permissible, limited circumstances, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does allow eating them. But remember, things which have been called, we have been ordered to refrain from them. These things will not be permitted in any condition in any condition, anywhere, anytime. So the order of refraining or the order of is even more strict. It is even more firm and it is even more clear than the words of haram. So this is exactly how we need to relate and understand how strict the unlawful, being unlawful of all forms of intoxicants is. Now, coming back to the history of the orders, the way it was relieved, uh, the orders for uh, intoxicants and drinking were revealed because we know that drinking was uh, deep rooted in the society of the Arabs and they were they were very much habitual to drinking. Drinks were prepared in houses and drinks were imbibed in all the houses. So the orders for the for leaving up and for giving up of all these intoxicants, they did not come in a single verse. And it was not like just one fine morning that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala announced that they are unlawful and now you're not permitted to consume any form of intoxicants. No. The order Orders came in three forms. The first were, uh, verse, which was revealed in uh, Surah Baqarah, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala said, "Yes, Aluna ka anil khamri wal maisari kultihi ma ismun wa manafiyul nas wa ismuhuma 
that Allah said that uh, it was clearly revealed that in all forms of alcohols there are there are advantages and there are disadvantages but the disadvantages are greater than the advantages and then despite all that uh, this this verse was what it was just like conveying a dislike it just dislike was conveyed and drinking was not abolished despite this verse conveying the dislike of drinking and gambling in the sight of Allah, despite this condition, we learn that the Arabs, they would keep on, or even the companions, they kept on drinking. And they used to drink, and the, the whole of the routine carried on. And then there was an occasion in which the companions, they had got together, and they had, um, they had a feast, and they drank. And then after that, they had uh, collected for the Salah of Isha as a congregational Salah. And the companion who led the congregational salah was slightly intoxicated and uh, he forgot there was an error while reciting surah al-kafirun and then the verse uh, verses of surah nisa were uh, revealed to prophet sallam and there it was said wala taqrabu salata wa antum sukara that when you are intoxicated you should not uh, offer your salah so but despite the verse of Surah Nisa being uh, revealed, despite that, even the companions, they continued to drink. They just had changed their routine and they had just changed their timetable. And like they would drink after the offering the Salah of Isha. So by the time of Fajr, the whole effect would wear off and they would, they would be uh, in a normal, mentally normal, same condition to offer the Salah of Fajr. So they had changed their timetable of drinking, but still, drinking was continuing and it was under this state of affairs that Hazrat Umar anhu, despite the fact that twice were the verses of Quran revealed despite the fact still drinking was prevalent in Mecca and Medina Hazrat Umar anhu, he used to supplicate and he used to say that oh Allah reveal an order reveal an order which will completely eradicate drinking so finally this verse number 90 of surah tulmaida this was revealed and um, when the verses uh, when these verses of surah tulmaida were revealed and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asked in these verses all those people who were being addressed when they when the verses were being revealed and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has asked in these verses, verses that will you uh, experience or display abstinence from all forms of intoxicants? And Hazrat Umar was the person who came out saying, in the haitana, in the haitana, in the haitana, yes, we will stay away from them and we will observe abstinence. And we learn from traditions by reported in Musnad Ahmad by Abu Huraira Raziallahu ta'ala anhu that Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that forbidding of strong drink was imposed gradually in three steps. It was it was gradually introduced in three steps. And these are the three steps which I've already explained to you. And we learn that this was important also because if you relate it with our normal daily experiences, we see that all people who are habitual to any form of intoxicants, it is very difficult to withdraw in just one fine morning. We have to get them admitted in uh, all those anti-narcotic centers, and then they stay in the anti-narcotic centers, and slowly the intoxicant, whatever form it is, it is slowly withdrawn, and other form of um, supportive drugs are started, and then their environment and their company and everything is changed and they're let, we let them be in that anti-narcotic center for like about two to three months where they go a slow withdrawal and a slow weaning process is started with alternative drugs as supportives and then only do people uh, succeed in overcoming that habit of, an, uh, uh, of any form of intoxicant and then we do learn that people do go back to the habit also. So this was this was one reason why all the orders regarding the leaving or refraining from the intoxicants were given in stages so that slowly and steadily people get to absorb it and slowly and steadily it becomes easy for them to withdraw and uh, to abstain from it. 
And uh, similarly, it has been reported that when these verses of Surah Al-Maida, they were revealed, Prophet Sallallahu addressed the people and he announced, he recited the verses of Surah Al-Maida, which were revealed regarding the orders of intoxicants. And then he addressed all of them and he announced that people, um, wine is prepared from four sources and he named like oats, barley, honey, grapes, and dates. And uh, wine from which has been prepared from any or extracted from any of these five, all of them is unlawful. So in response and as an explanation of these verses, Prophet ﷺ clearly announced the words of unlawful, of intoxicants being unlawful in the words of Hadith. Similarly, an occasion has been, uh, incident has been reported by Hazrat Anas radiallahu ta'ala anhu in Bukhari and Muslim. And he explains that um, there were some friends, some companions who had collected at the house of my benefactor, Hazrat Abu Talha Ansari. And um, he, he was, um, they had all get, uh, got together for a feast and uh, wine was being served. And I was acting as the cup bearer at the commandment of um, Hazrat Abu Talha bin Zayd Ansari. And then what happened was that these verses were revealed to Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he announced the, uh, he announced that all forms of intoxicants, they were unlawful to be consumed. And then a person who was an uh, announcer would go around a crier and announcer would go around the city announcing the words, uh, the words of the verses and announces what Prophet told. And he said that when I was serving wine, we heard a person outside calling out an announcement on uh, which my father, my stepfather, Abu Talha, he told me to go out and see what it, what it was about. And I went out and I heard the verses and I heard what Prophet Sallallahu also had explained. And I came in and I informed him of how the alcoholic drinks had been forbidden, reciting the verses which I had heard and telling the words which I had heard Prophet Sallallahu tell. And Abu Talha, he told me to go away and throw out all the wine, uh, wine that was in the house and um, has Zatana said that I did so, and uh, he also has reported that in streets of Medina, there was uh, there was wine overflowing in all the streets of Medina. This was the response of whom? This was the response of all those who would understand Arabic grammatically, and it was like a mother tongue to them. So when in Arabic, the Arabic people, when they learned the Arabic verses, how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had told, talked about, and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had told them to fajta nibuhu la'allakum tuflihun, so they realized that it was no longer lawful for them and they broke all the all the containers and wine was flowing in the streets after the revolution of these verses of Quran. And then there were a series of questions. People came over with a series of questions regarding alcohol to Prophet Sallallahu as has been reported in Hazrat Abu, by Abu Sayyid Khudri in Tirimzi, that there was some wine in my house, which was the property of an orphan. So when the verses of the surah was revealed, I went over to Prophet Sallallahu and I asked him what was to be done with him. Since this was in a property of, a, of, a, of an orphan, I asked that, can we sell it or can we change it into some other forms and sell it? And Prophet Sallallahu said, no, I've told you, throw it away and pour it out. Similarly, there were people who came over to Prophet Sallallahu and one of the companions, like it's been reported by um, Hazrat Wail Hazarmi in Muslim, uh, in Muslim that Prophet Sallallahu was asked by a person that I take it as a medicine, that I don't use it, I don't use wine and alcohol as an intoxicant, but I take it as a medicine. So is it permissible for me? Prophet Sallallahu answered, no, it is not a medicine. It is a disease. It is a disease. Similarly, there were people who asked that we've understood that it's unlawful for all the followers of uh, Prophet Sallallahu but we have neighbors who are Jews and can we pass it on to them as gifts? Prophet Sallallahu said that gift of a haram thing is also not permissible. Similarly, some of them asked that can we convert it into vinegar and then sell it? Prophet Sallallahu told very strictly that I've told you that just, just get away with it and get just get rid of it and pour it away and just let it go away. Similarly, there was an incident 
that uh, people from the Humeri, Banu Humer, they came over and uh, there was a companion, the Alim Humeri. He came over to Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he asked him, he asked him that we live in a cold region and we live in a mountainous cold region, which has high altitude and it's very cold there and it is very high there. And we are laborers by profession and we work hard. And we manufacture wine from wheat. And when we come back from our um, full day's work and labor, and we are very tired, we consume this. We drink it, and it gives us warmth, and it gives us energy, and it relieves the exhaustion of the day. So can we keep on taking it? The first question Prophet Salaam came up with is, that is it intoxicating also? Is it intoxicating? He said, yes. And Prophet Salaam said, then, if it is intoxicating, then stay away from it. Then abstain from it and do not drink it at all. And then the companion answered. He said that, okay, Prophet Salaam, I myself, I've directly heard it from you and I will refrain from it and I will, I will be abstinence. I will practice abstinence from all forms of wine and drinks. But if I go and convey this message to all those of my people of my tribe, they will not be they will not be convinced and i will not be able to persuade them and convince them and then if to this response which he heard that the people of tribe will respond with prophet salavalism said then wage war against them if they do not listen to you that you go and you announce them what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told in the verse number 90 of Surah al maida and then you go and pass on my words and explanations of hadith and traditions also. And despite the fact that I very categorically say that it is unlawful, and despite the facts that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will really clear cut form says that abstain from it and refrain from it, and despite the fact that if all such clear cut instructions, they still opt to drink and they still do not opt to leave it, then do what? Then you have to launch a war against them. So this is the order of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam for an Islamic state. And in Islamic state, the citizens of the Islamic state, if they drink and they persist and they just want to go on drinking and they do not want to leave it, then there is a war against such Muslim citizens of an Islamic state. How cross, how grievous. And still we have debates and discussions that wine and intoxicants are not haram. It has been reported in Tirmizi by Hazrat Anas ta'ala anhu that Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam cursed. And you know that for any, any, evil deed or sin where there are words of being cursed this becomes a major sin so prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam cursed 10 people in connection with wine and these 10 people are he who distills the wine he who distills the wine even if for someone else number 2 he who distills wines for himself third, who drinks the wine, fourth, who serves the wine, fifth, who carries the wine from one place to another, fifth, who receives or accepts wine as something sent as a gift, or seventh, who sells wine, eighth, who buys wine, ninth, who gives wine to another as a gift, and tenth is the person who eats of the money which comes to him from selling wine. So such detail has been explained in this tradition that it actually means what it highlights that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to do what abolish abolish drinking from the society in all forms and it is like it is wanted and desired that in an Islamic state the whole of the industry all the industry which is related to the to the distilling of to the buying to the selling to the serving all the industry of wine and intoxicants should be collapsed and it should be totally uprooted and abolished from the islamic society and that is why in other tradition we learn that prophet sallam said that a person who just stores grapes in the season of the harvest of the grapes, he doesn't sell the grapes, but he just stores the grapes so that he will sell these grapes to a person who will distill or extract wine out of that. He will, he is, he's doing what? He is dealing for a piece of hell fire. Similarly, Prophet ﷺ has been reported to inform all of us two traditions with similar words and with a similar punishment. Three people, 
three people, Prophet وسلم, has been reported to say that three people on the day of judgment, they will not receive the scent from Jannah, although the scent of Jannah will be coming from a very far off distance. Similarly, Prophet وسلم, said that there were four people for which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taken the responsibility and the charge on himself that he himself will not let them enter Jannah. So these three and these four are what? A person or people who are disobedient to their parents. Second is the person who is habitual to intoxicants or drinking. Third is the person who uses or avails of usury or interest in his monetary matters or in his business transactions and dealings. And the fourth is a person who, who consumes the inheritance of the orphans. So this is how cursed and how disliked all forms of drinking and intoxicants is. Similarly, it has been related by Hazrat Ibn Abbas ta'ala, and who in Mustad Ahmad that Prophet said, whoever drinks habitually, whoever drinks habitually and dies in that state will be produced before Allah on the day of resurrection as a polytheist and as an idolater. It has been reported in Musnad Ahmad. Similarly, it has been reported in Musnad Ahmad that Prophet Sallallahu said that my Lord, my Lord, the Almighty, Allah Almighty has vowed by his power and glory. What does, the, what does the tradition tell us, all of us, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah the Almighty, has vowed by his power and glory that whoever of his bondsmen will take even a draught of wine, he will make him swallow an equal amount of pus in the hereafter. And whoever of his bondsmen will give up drinking and abstain from it out of the fear of Allah, he will give to him the drink, the pure wines of from the Jannah on the hereafter. Similarly, has been reported by Hazrat Jabir ta'ala and who in Muslim, the Prophet وسلم, said that every intoxicant is forbidden. And it is the promise of the Lord concerning everyone who indulges in alcoholic beverages that he has made it a binding upon himself to fulfill the promise that he will make him drink Tina Tul Khabal in hereafter. And when the companions asked what Tinatul Khabal was, he said, it will be the perspiration, the perspiration exuded, exuded through the skin of the dwellers of hell or the pus which will be discharging from their wounds to their bodies. Allahumma la taj'alna minhum. So this is the importance of considering vine and intoxicants unlawful and to refrain from them. Hazrat Jabir who has reported in Abu Dawud, the Rimzi and Ibn Majah, the Prophet ﷺ said that a small quantity of liquor will also produce intoxicant when taken in a large quantity is also forbidden. As has been sent and uh, has been informed in a tradition, Kullu askarin khamar, Kullu askarin haram, that all the things which, which intoxicate, all forms of intoxications, all forms of intoxicants which intoxicate, they are khamar and all forms of khamar and intoxicants are haram and they are unlawful. May they be wine or shari or brandy or heroin or any forms of marijuana or opium or narcotics. May it be drunk, may it be taken in form of an oral solution or it may be sniffed or it may be injected or it may be ingested in any form. When anything taken in any form, it is an intoxicant and intoxicates the person, then it does what? It is definitely unlawful and it is haram. Abi Malik actually does Allah Ta'ala and he reports in Abu Dawud and Ibn Majah the Prophet said, some people among my followers will drink wine and give it another name by the way of deception. And there are words in other words in Hadith that Allah the Prophet said that out of these Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala will make some of them as swines and some of them as, <coughs> as pigs. And we also learn by traditions that Prophet Wasallam has told us that Muslims, all the believers and Muslims, they are also, it is prohibited for them to eat on any table where wine is being served. 
So even if one of the Muslims are hypocrites, they are serving wine by their hospitality, may it be the marriage functions or any other functions, even if in a hypocrite, they are serving wine, then Muslims and believers are not supposed to eat and drink on that table. So this is all what is regarding the importance of wine and all forms of intoxicants being haram. Allah says very clearly, Shaitan, why is this haram and unlawful? Because Shaitan only wants to cast between you animosity and hatred through intoxicants and gambling and to avert you from the remembrance of Allah and from prayer. So will you not desist? To this was the answer of Hazrat Umar anhu, and Haitana that we will all refrain and desist and obey Allah and obey the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam and be aware if you turn away then know that upon our messenger is only the responsibility for clear notification there is not upon those who believe and do righteousness any blame concerning what they have eaten in the past if they now fear Allah and believe and do righteous deeds and then fear Allah and believe and then fear Allah and do good. And Allah loves those who are the doers of good. So here in this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning that all those who seek repentance after listening or after going through all these commandments regarding all forms of intoxicants and gambling, if they seek forgiveness and they give up all these bad deeds and evil deeds and sinful activities and they fear Allah and revert and they return with uh, forgiveness, seeking forgiveness towards Allah, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reward them and Allah will forgive them. O oh, you who believed, Allah will surely test you through something of the game that your hands and spears can reach, that Allah may make evident that those who fear him unseen and whoever transgresses after that for him is a painful punishment. Verse number 95, O oh, you who have believed, do not kill game while you are in a state of ihram and whoever of you kills it intentionally the penalty is an equivalent, an equivalent from sacrificed animals to what he killed, as judged by two just men among you as an offering to Allah delivered as an as an offering to Allah delivered to Kaaba or an expiation is what the feeding of needy people or the equivalent of that in fasting that he may taste the consequence of his deed. Allah has pardoned what is past, but whoever returns to violation, then Allah will take retribution for him. And Allah is exalted in might and owner of retribution. So now this is another don't of Quran, right in the first verse also, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has clearly explained that hunting, hunting during a stage of ihram was made unlawful. So here also Allah is clearly explaining a don't of Quran that killing of game. Killing of game or hunting in a condition of ihram, whether it may be for the purpose of hajj or for umrah, in a state of ihram, killing and hunting of animals is strictly prohibited. Especially how is it prohibited that if a person is in ihram and he kills or hunts for himself, then this will be unlawful. If he kills for someone else also, if a person in ihram kills for someone else also, this will also be haram. But if there is another person, if there's another person who is not in ihram and he kills it for the person who is in ihram, this will also be haram. But if the second person who is not in a state of ihram, if he kills or hunts the animal for himself and then the person in ihram wants to eat it, then it will not be unlawful or haram for him. We have an incident in the life of Prophet Sallallahu which explained how the companions, they obeyed the orders of Allah to the finest of extent and to the minutest of detail. The companions, they explain that they were traveling with Prophet Sallallahu 
for performing Umrah to, uh, to Makkah, and they were in a state of ihram, and they had learned these verses of Quran, and they knew that they were not allowed to hunt or to, um, to kill animals during ihram. And they said that uh, we were traveling for Umrah in the sixth of uh, sixth Hijri, and there was an extreme shortage of all form of foods and provision. And we were sitting in a camp, all of the companions who were wearing the ihram in a state of ihram, they said that we were sitting in a camp and we were all extremely hungry. But among us was a traveler who was a passerby and the person was not in ihram. So what happened was, from as a trial from Allah, there came a zebra and the zebra stood at the door of the camp and would not move. And all the companions in Ihram, they saw the zebra, they all empty stomach, they were all feeling hungry with no provisions of food, but none of them, none of them could ever imagine violating the prohibited limits of Allah. They all sat there. They all sat, none of them got up and tried to hunt the zebra, We just stood at the door of the camp. And you know what happened is that all of them, they were looking at the zebra and they were seeing that the zebra, the animal of hunt was very much there. But the only person who could not see the zebra was what? Was the traveler who was without the ihram. And you know what the companions did? None of them, not even one of them, as Allah says, we've just went through the verse of Surah Maida, وَلَا تَعْوَنُوا لِلْإِسْمِ وَالْأُدْوَانِ so none of them did point out, none of them called out and told him that he should get up and hunt. And they did not even by word of mouth or by any, any pointing of their finger or by any body movement, did they give a gesture to inform that traveler without ihram that there was a hunt available for all of them. Till the point that the traveler himself turned around and he caught a sight of the zebra standing there. And then he climbed up. He climbed on his ride and he um, got decided that he will hunt the zebra. But in the mean period, what happened in the meantime was that his lasso, with which he was intending to um, carry on the hunt, the lasso fell down on the ground. And what he did was, you know, that traveler who was intending to do the hunt with the lasso, he requested all the companions to pick up the lasso from the ground and hand him over the lasso so that he could quickly go and hunt the zebra and bring it for all of them. Because, but... They did what? None of them did budge an inch and they did not even get up to cooperate with him and pick up the lesson and hand it over to him. This was their sensitivity. And this was how mindful they were of the lawful and the unlawful things and the limits of Allah. Till the time that he got down and then he picked up his lasso, he again climbed, he did the hunt, he killed the zebra, and then he brought the hunt, which he had obviously done for his own self, for the desire to eat himself. So it was lawful for the companions. The companions also um, ate the food, ate the flesh of the zebra. And even we learn from traditions that Prophet ﷺ also consumed some of the meat of the zebra. So this was a trial for them and how steadfast they were, despite the fact they realized that it would have run away and they would all be still deprived staying in the condition. Lawful to you is game from the sea and its foods as provision for you and the travelers, but forbidden to you is game from the land as long as you are in a state of ihram and fear Allah to whom you will be gathered. So in this verse 96, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is permitting that if there's a traveler in ihram, a person, a pilgrim who is in a state of ihram, but is traveling by sea and all the food and the provisions finish, then it is permissible for him to hunt from the sea. Because you know, while a person is traveling on the sea, there is obviously the provisions finished, there is no alternative source of any other form of food other than hunting from the sea. But in contrast to that, if a person is traveling by land, then there are many other forms of food available without hunting also. <clears throat> 
Allah has made the Kaaba, the sacred house, standing for people and has sanctified the sacred months and the sacrificing animals and the garlands by which they are identified. That is so you may know that Allah knows what is in the heavens and what is in the earth and that Allah is knowing of all the things. Know that Allah is severe in penalty and Allah is forgiving and merciful. Not upon the messenger is responsibility except for notification and Allah knows whatever you reveal and whatever you conceal. Verse number 100, say not equal are the evil and the good. Not equal are the evil and the good, although the abundance of evil might impress you. So fear Allah, O you of understanding, that you may be successful. You know, this is exactly so. We do realize that the equal... Evil and equal, evil and good, they are not, they are not the same in the sight of Allah, and they should not be the same in our sight and our opinion also. But we need to remember what this verse is saying is that we need to remember that abundance of evil, abundance of evil does not make it good and righteous, however impressive and attractive that evil may be. And the scarcity. The scarcity of goodness doesn't make it evil. It doesn't make it evil, however scarce, however unimpressive, or however unattractive it may be. People indulging in evil will always be evil itself. Like we do experience in the society around ourselves, we see that majority of the women, even in a Muslim society, they go about without an Islamic dress code. Majority of the Muslim women in most of the Islamic states, they are going about without the dress code suggested, ordered, enjoined by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Quran. And this dress code, the worldly dress code, other than the dress code of Allah, these women, they look very smart and they look very refined and polished and confident and successful. But this dress looking attractive and catchy, it still will not be the dressed coat of piety. It will still not come up to the level of libasu taqwa, which Allah says, libasu taqwa dhalika khair. Similarly, we do come across the situation that majority of the people, majority of the people in a Muslim society, in a Muslim state, they listen to music, they watch dramas, they watch movies, they go to concerts. But despite the majority of people indulging in all these activities, these all remain what? They all remain unlawful and they all remain evil in any case. Allahumma arin al haqqa haqqan wa rizukna tiba'a. Allahumma arin al batila batilan wa rizukna jtinaba. O oh, you who have believed, do not ask about things which, if they are shown to you, will distress you. But if you ask about them while the Quran is being revealed, they will be shown to you. Allah has pardoned that which is past, and Allah is forgiving and forbearing. Uh, this was uh, the verse was revealed in a situation that there were companions sitting with Prophet Sallallahu and that he was in a state of receiving a revolution. And a companion, while the state while process, uh, Prophet Sallallahu was in a situation of receiving revolution, a companion would go on asking that Prophet Sallallahu is performing pilgrimage or hajj. Is it obligatory every year? Prophet Sallallahu was silent because he was receiving the revelation and he wouldn't answer, but he would keep on repeating the same question over and over again. And that is why this verse was revealed. And Prophet Sallallahu also guided him and said that if I had answered according to the order of Allah that yes, then we would have, it would have become very difficult for all the Muslims of the Ummah to perform Hajj every year as an obligation. So what we collect from here is that asking questions and questioning is no doubt 
it is it is light for certain situations, but we need to be very careful about asking questions. We have to be very mindful while we are asking questions that with what intention the question is being asked, questions which have been asked because of creating corruption and malice or fitna are obviously, well, fitna to ashadu min al-qatl, but question which has been asked to improve the knowledge and which has been asked to improve our activities and our manners, they are allowed, they are permissible, and in fact are also light for all of us. A people ask such questions before you, then they became thereby disbelievers. This is referring to what the questions of the people of Bani Israel when they were ordered to slaughter a cow. Verse number 103, Allah has appointed Allah has not appointed such innovations as the Bahira, the Saiba, the Wasila, or the Ham, but those who disbelieve invent falsehood about Allah, and most of them do not reason. So what is all this about is that uh, it was a polytheistic, fabricated belief of the people of Mecca. They had created it out of themselves. They, they had started believing that when the camel, one of their livestock, the camels, the goat, the sheep, they thought that when they reached a certain criteria, which they had fixed all by themselves. When they had reached a certain criteria, which the people of Mecca, they had fixed up, they would give them some self-created names like Bahira, Saiba, Wasila, or Ham. And then what they used to do after that is that they used to free them. They used to free them on the name of their idols. Why? To please the idols by freeing these livestock for the sake of the worship of idols. And they used to set them free for their gods and setting them free for their idols or for the stone altars or for their gods. They did what? They didn't ride them. They did not load heavy loads on them to be carried. They did not milk them. They did not use their wool or eat anything from them. And they were just set free to roam about in the streets and the fields. So rather than them being useful, all these livestock, they ended up doing what? Being, being harmful, being, uh, being, being a source of damage and destruction for the people around them. So Allah has clearly negated this uh, concept. There is nothing like a Bahira, Saiba, Wasila, or Ham. And this is what this is, all a major polytheism in the rites and in the worships of Allah. And when it is said to them, come to what Allah has revealed and to the messenger, they say, sufficient for us is that upon which we found our fathers, even though their fathers knew nothing, nor were they guided. Or you would have believed, or you who have believed upon you is responsibility for yourselves. And those who have gone astray will not harm them when you have been to the guided. To Allah is your return altogether. Then he will inform you of what you used to do. Allahumma hasibna hisab yasira. O oh, you who have believed testimony should be taken among you when death approaches one of you at the time of bequest. These verses, this verse was basically revealed when there was an incident in the life of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. There was a Muslim believer who was traveling and on his way back before he had reached his home, he fell sick. And he was so sick that he was almost about when he was close to his death. What he did was that he gathered all his personal belongings and positions he had during his travel and he put them in a bag. And he wrote a list of all these personal belongings. He put them, he put this list just lower down in the bag and on top of all the in on top of the list he put back in the bag or in the sack he put all his belongings and then he handed over these belongings of his with the list deep down in the bag hidden and concealed he handed over this bag of his personal belongings to one of the companion travelers and he requested the companions the uh, the companion travelers to uh, pass on all these things and to uh, give these things to their to his heirs in the in his own in in his own um or in his uh, city when they reached there and he wrote down uh will also and handed 
the will over to the companions. Now, when he died and he passed away, these people with whom he had entrusted all his personal belongings and his will also for his heirs, they became distrustful and they opened up that bag. And just on top of all the things, they found a golden, a beautiful golden carved bowl for which they, they took it away and they created a theft. And the rest of the belongings, when they reached the city, they handed them over to the heirs along with the will the person deceased person had handed them over. Now, when the heirs, they opened up the bag and they took out the, the personal possessions, they, in the end of the bag, they found out the list of all the objects also. And from the list of the object, what was missing was that golden bag, that golden bowl. So without making a negative assumption that they had stolen those that golden bag, that golden bowl, they immediately went back to those companions and asked them whether the person before he died for the cause of his treatment of raising any form of money had he had he sold some of his personal belongings and they said that the, that he had not because obviously they did not know that they'd found out the list of all the things and they'd located that that golden bowl was missing however when they refused so that was a clear-cut indication that it had been stolen and they had created the theft of that golden bowl so the whole case was brought to prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and uh, then they were the companion the traveler companions who had been entrusted by the positions they were asked to come and they swore they, they were liars, they were thieves, they were liars as well. And Umul Khabais, lying, telling lies, helps you get away with all forms of major and minor sins. So they told a lie, they made, uh, they made false swear, and they got away. And then after a few days, when they sold this golden bowl to a goldsmith, the goldsmith somehow managed to get the information to the heirs. And finally, they were found, it was found out that they were actually the thieves and they had stolen the golden bowl. So the case was again brought to Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and these verses were revealed. And Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala instructed the method of negating the previous swear they had made to get away from the punishment of uh, stealing the golden bowl. And so now when we read the verses, we will be verses, we will be able to understand what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had given the order now. Allah says, oh, you who have believed testimony should be taken among you when death approaches one of you at the time of bequest, that that of you, two just men from among you or two others from outside, if you are traveling through the land and the disaster of death should strike you, detain them after the prayer and let them both swear by Allah that if, if you doubt their testimony saying, we will not exchange our oath for a price, even if he should be a near relative and we will not withhold the testimony of Allah. Indeed, we would then be of the sinful. But if it is found that those two were guilty of perjury, let two others stand in their place who are foremost in claim from those who have a lawful right and let them swear by Allah. Our testimony, they will swear saying this, that our testimony is truer than their testimony and we have not transgressed. Indeed, we would then be of the wrongdoers. That is more likely that they will give testimony according to its true objective, or at least they would fear that others' oaths might be taken after their oaths and fear Allah and listen and listen. And Allah does not guide the defiantly disobedient people. Allahumma la tajalna minhum. Be warned of, be warned of the day when Allah will assemble the messengers and say, what was the response you received? They will say, we have no knowledge. Indeed, it is you who is the knower of unseen. Verse number 110, the day when Allah will say, O Isa alayhi salam, the son of Maryam alayhi salam, remember my favor upon you and upon your mother. So in this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning a dialogue which will take place between Allah and Hazrat Isa alayhi salam on the day of judgment. And here Allah is mentioning the blessings, the bounties and the miracles which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had blessed Hazrat Isa alayhi salam with. Allah will remind all these blessings, bounties and miracles 
blessed by him on the day of judgment. Allah will say, remember my favor upon you and upon your mother when I supported you with the pure spirit and you spoke to the people in the cradle and in maturity. Remember when I taught you writing and wisdom and Torah and the Injil and when you designed from clay what was like the form of a bird with my permission and then you breathed into it and it became a bird with my permission and you healed the blind and the leper with my permission and when you brought forth the dead with my permission all the miracles which were given to Hazrat Musa alayhi salam, to Hazrat Isa alayhi salam, to Hazrat Dawud alayhi salam, all these miracles were not by the struggle or the striving or the efforts of the prophets themselves. No, these were the miracles which were blessed to the prophets by the will and the mercy and the permission of Allah. When you brought forth the dead with my permission, when I restrained the children of Israel from killing you, when you came to them with clear proofs and those who disbelieved among them said, this is not but an obvious magic. And remember what I inspired to the disciples, believe in me and my messenger, Isa alayhi salam. They said, we have believed, so bear witness that indeed we are Muslims in submission to Allah. Verse number 112, this is from where the surah gets its name. And remember when the disciples said, O Isa alayhi salam, son of Maryam alayhi salam, can your Lord send down to us a table spread with food from the heaven? Isa alayhi salam said, fear Allah, if you should be believers. So we learn that this is the verse which gives the surah its name. They had requested Hazrat Musa, Hazrat Isa alayhi salam to supplicate that, uh, that a ma'idah, that a table laden with food, a ma'idah be, <coughs> <coughs> be sent down to them from <coughs> heaven. Now, why have the disciples of Hazrat Isa alayhi salam, why have they asked of such a special miracle delivery of the Maida? The first reason is obviously because Bani Israel, they, they were used to receiving such things. As the followers of Hazrat Musa alayhi salam, they had received man and salva. They had received the shades of the clouds and they had received the miraculous coming out of the springs and fountains from the mountains. So they were like used to receiving such miraculous provisions from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. <clears throat> so that is why they requested the uh, prophet to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the miracles all over again. The second thing was that uh, all these disciples, the followers of Hazrat Isa alayhi salam, they had currently, they had currently also observed that Hazrat Maryam alayhi salam was also being blessed by heavenly uh, fruits which were not seasonal. And the third reason was that Hazrat Isa alayhi salam himself was given miracles and he was showing them all the miracles. So they realized that if Allah has blessed Hazrat Isa alayhi salam with so many miracles, that he can also give another miracle of uh, sending down all forms of provisions from the heavens also. So, but despite seeing all these miracles, uh, Hazrat Isa alayhi salam, he supplicated and then the, the supplication was heard and they received this maida. But despite all this, observing all of these miracles, instead of increasing in faith, belief and obedience, they were still stubborn and obstinate and they considered, they still continued in their disobedience. Verse number 113, they said, why are we asking for this uh, maida is we wish to eat from it and we let our hearts be reassured and know that you have been truthful to us and be among its witnesses. Verse 114, Hazrat Isa alayhi salam said, O oh Allah, our Lord, send down to us a table spread with food from the heaven to be for us a festival for the first of us and for the last of us and a sign from you and provide for us. You are the best of providers. So this part of the verse, wa anta khayru raziqeen, this can be taken as a supplication for asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for provisions and for lawful earnings and and for a, a respectable and honorable source of living and livelihood in this worldly life. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
you are all merciful. You are the Rahman. You are the Rahim. And you are the Raziq. You are Khairul Raziqeen. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you are the sustainer. You are the caretaker. You are the provider. Provide us all. Provide us all with halal risk, with ease, with respect, with comfort and honor. Allahumma kfini an halalika an haramik wa aqnini bi fadlika amman sawaq. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make our male members of the family realize the importance of lawful earning. Save our accounts, save our bank balances, our accounts from any form of, from any form of unlawful earnings, even a penny of unlawful earnings. Save us all from all of that. Help us, support us, guide us, protect us, and protect our husbands and sons and brothers. Help them, guide them, and support them, and protect them. Help earn them all forms of lawful livelihoods for all of us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, let us be the Muslim women who adopt simplicity in splendid and make us among the grateful, patient, and reliant Muslim submitting servants of Allah. Allahumma ja'alni sabura wa ja'alni shakura wa ja'alni fi aini sagira wa fi a'yunin nasi kabira. Allah said, indeed, I will send it down to you, but whoever disbelieves afterwards from among you, then indeed will I punish him with a punishment by which I have not punished anyone among the worlds. And be aware the day when Allah will say, oh, Isa alayhi salam, the son of Maryam alayhi salam, did you, did you say to the people, take me and my mother as deities besides Allah? This is like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here is negating the concept of or the belief of Trinity adopted as an innovation by the Christians that on the day of judgment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will ask your prophet if he ordered you to do all that. And what will Hazrat Isa Islam say on the day of judgment? He will say, exalted are you. It was not for me to say that to which I have no right. If I had said it, you would have known it. And you know what is within myself, and I do not know what is within yourself. Indeed, it is you who is nor of the unseen. I said not to them except what you commanded me to worship Allah, my Lord, and your Lord. And I, well, I was a witness over them as long as I was among them. But when you took me up, you were the observer over them, and you were over all things a witness. And if you should punish them, Verse number 118, Allah says, Hazrat uh, Isa alayhi salam will say that if you should punish them, indeed, they are your servants. And if you forgive them, indeed, it is you who is exalted in might and wise. And we do learn from traditions that one night, Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam was reciting Surah Maida in his Salah of the Hajjud. And he reached this one of these last verses of Surah Al-Maida. And he would go on reciting and repeating this verse over and over again till it was the time of Fajr and the proclamation of the Fajr Salah was announced. This was why. This was for the love, for the love of his Ummah. This was for the fear of punishment of his followers. This was for a desire of forgiveness for the Muslims of the Ummah. He kept on, he kept on repeating. He wept. And he kept on reciting the verse till the time of the Salah of Fajr. How much did he love all of us? How much he feared the, the punishments of hellfire for all of us? Do we love him equally? Do we, do we work and strive and struggle for, for the overpowering of his beloved religion equally? Allah bless us all the ability to do all this. Verse number 111, Allah will say on the day of judgment, an announcement which will be made by Allah. This is the day. This is the day when the truthful will benefit from their truthfulness. For them are gardens in paradise beneath which rivers will flow, wherein they will abide forever. Allah being pleased with them and they with him. That is the greatest attainment. In this verse, number 119, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning and promising and proclaiming and announcing the reward of whom? Of all those who are the truthful. 
what beautiful reward Allah has mentioned on the day of judgment for those who tend to stay to truth, to stick to truth in their life. They have been promised as paradise. They have been, they have been promised as an eternal abode in the paradise. And they have been promised as the player in the love and the nearness of Allah. And Allah has said that they will be those who will have the greatest attainment. So this is the importance of truth in the life of a believer. We know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself, he says, Waman hadisa, that what is more true than what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says himself. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was renowned. He was known as as al-Amin. Allah mentions about all the prophets in Quran. Allah says they are what? They were what? Innahu qana siddiqan nabiyya. They were the truthful and they were the prophets and the messengers. So the first trait which Allah mentions were all the prophets and messengers is that they were the truthful. The companions of Prophet ﷺ, they were whom? When Prophet ﷺ was asked, whom do you love the most? He said, Aisha Siddiqa, the beloved wife. And then he was asked, who among the men do you love the most? He said, Abu Bakr Siddiq. He was the true companion of Prophet ﷺ, loving him, believing in him with the truth of his heart. And then another companion of Prophet ﷺ, Hazrat Abu Zar Ghaffari, Prophet ﷺ said, no one, no one has seen anyone more truthful on this earth, more truthful on this earth other than Abu Zar Ghaffari. Honesty and truthfulness is a manner of the believer. And in contrast, if a person after saying la ilaha illallah, after announcing and after claiming that he does believe, still clings to falsehood, he has what? That person has a sign of hypocrisy, as has been reported in the tradition of Muslim and Bukhari, ayatul munafiq rub'ah. There are four signs of a hypocrite. The first being in, in this tradition and the first being in Surah Baqarah is, is a hadasa qasaba. That when he talks, he tells a lie. He is a liar. Despite the fact that he establishes salah and he, he fasts in the month of Ramadan, but if a believer, despite the fact, doing all the acts of worship, according to this true tradition of Muslim and Bukhari, is telling lies, is falsifying, is what has a sign of hypocrisy until and unless he gets rid, he gets rid of this habit in his life. So this is truth. Prophet Sallallahu has instructed all of us. He said, stick to the truth. Stick to the truth because truth leads to piety and righteousness. And piety and righteousness leads to Jannah. A person keeps on firmly sticking to truth in his life and his name is finally entered in the list of the truthful. And then Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has also warned us, stay away from telling lies and falsehood because falsehood and telling lies, they, they lead to sin. They lead to sin and evil and evil and sin leads to hell fire. And a person goes on telling lies and falsifying till his name is entered into the list of liars and falsifiers. A truthful person is whom a truthful person is not only the person who, who just tells the truth and who just sticks up to all forms of truth in his life. A truthful person is the one who believes in the truth, who supports the truth, who helps the truth, who protects the truth, who likes the truthful, who helps, protects, and supports the truthful, stands up for them, fights up for them, and a truthful person is the one who dislikes all forms of false, who dislikes all forms of telling of lies, who dislikes the liars and who stands up, who fights against the lies and who fights against all forms of falsified behaviors and acts and deeds and all those who falsify and refuse the truth. So this is a true believer and this is a truthful person in the complete perspective of morals and deeds and manners. Allahumma tawahir qalbi min al-nifaki wa amali min al-riyai wa lisani min al-qasabi wa aini min al-khayanati inna ka taqlamu man khayanati al-aini wa ma tuhfi al-sudur. 
To Allah belongs the dominion of the heavens and the earth and whatever is within them. And he is over all things competent. Alhamdulillah. Summa alhamdulillah. We have completed Surah Maida. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept it from all of us. May Allah help us remember the commandments and the messages and the orders of Surah Al-Maida. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us believe and act on the teachings of the Surah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us stay steadfast on the path of Sarat al-Mustaqeem. Allahumma hasibna khisabi yasira. Allahumma ajirna minan nar. Allahumma ajirna minan nar. Allahumma ajirna minan nar. Rabbibni li'inda ka baytan fil jannah. Allahumma hasibna khisabi yasira. Rabbana la tuzi' qulubana ba'da is hadaytana wa hablana min ladunka rahma innaka antal wahab. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika. Nashhadu an la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu alayk. Subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun. Wassalamun ala al-mursaleen. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Ameen summa ameen.